Good afternoon. My name is Harry Anderson. I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I am Tracy Sambo from Sweetwater, Texas. We're going to start with the first lecture. This is Alexandra Wright, who's a resident physician, Department of Surgery, Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And she'll be presenting Analyzing Disparities in Trauma Care, a Heavy Burden with Minimal Resource. Um, all right, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to first thank uh, my collaborators for all of their time, effort, and uh, mentorship during this project. Um, I'll be discussing our project on two hospitals that care for trauma patients, um, one Grady Memorial and Atlanta Hospital, and we did a comparison with uh, San Juan de Dios, a hospital in Santa Cruz, Bolivia. Um, I hope you'll gain a few uh, learning points from this, this discussion. Um, the first being that you understand some of the similarities and differences that exist between trauma care in the United States and Bolivia, um, that you learn a bit about system level bar barriers and potential interventions that exist in more limited resource settings, and that um, we, we discuss a little bit about strategic collaboration um, between um, different systems that can help overcome certain barriers. Um, I'm going to start our discussion with a little bit about the Bolivian Trauma and Surgical Initiative. Um, this is a project I'm very honored to be a part of. It's been ongoing since 2015. It began as a collaboration between um, Dr. Mamta Saroop, a professor of trauma at Northwestern University, and um, Clinica Fonini, uh, a doctor with Dr. Fonini there. Um, he is a physician out of Santa Cruz, Bolivia. Um, the collaboration has been ongoing. Um, I myself am a Emory University resident um, and uh, one of the prior residents and, and current resident who is uh, stationed in Bolivia right now um, also is through Emory University. Um, most recently, we're proud to have uh, achieved the benchmark of um, gaining an uh, NIH Fogarty Global Health Fellowship grant um, for our current in-country in fellow, and that's um, Dr. Constance Schreckengos. Um, and what's, what's different about um, our initiative is it's really allowed um, great collaborations to build. So we actually started, Dr. Marissa Boek was the first resident to go down to Bolivia and start um, implementing trauma registries with the hospital system down in Santa Cruz, Bolivia. Um, she was followed by Dr. Sam South, who's currently a fellow at the University of Utah now. Um, Dr. Ludi and I both overlapped um, for a time in Bolivia, and then Dr. Shrekengos is our current um, fellow. Um, so what, what this has allowed is since 2015, we've had an in-country um, resident uh, research fellow there collaborating with uh, the Bolivian hospital system to offer basically our, our free labor um, <laughs> for them and, and um, helping to advance their trauma system. Um, so out of that sort of core group of individuals, we've been able to build additional collaborations. Um, so this project specifically was, was done between faculty at Grady Memorial, that's Dr. Smith and Caganti, and then um, some faculty at Hospital San Juan de Dios, and that's Dr. Gross and Dr. Cuiar Crespo. So to pivot a little bit about this specific project, um, we looked at uh, trauma within this, and we, we all know that trauma is an immense burden. Um, disproportionately low in middle-income countries and certainly affects um, overwhelmingly young people um, and disrupts their life. Um, these, these statistics come from the World Bank. Um, you can see that the United States, um, we have lower traffic deaths than Bolivia, but if you look at per 100,000 vehicles, you can see that that number sort of shifts in the severity um, and that actually number is continuing to rise in Bolivia as more and more um, vehicles take to the road. And then you can see that actually, unlike other countries in Latin America or South America, Bolivia does not have um, a very high violence rate. They actually, um, I would tell my parents when I was living in Bolivia that um, I was probably safer there than the neighborhood I currently live in Atlanta. Um, so to, to discuss a little bit about Grady Memorial Hospital, um, it's one of the largest public hospitals in the United States. It's um, nearly a thousand beds. It's a level one trauma center very busy. Um, hospital San Juan de Dios is one of the larger hospitals in Santa Cruz, Bolivia. It's 240 beds. They do not have an official trauma um, designation at, at this time, but um, it is a tertiary referral center 
one with a CT scanner and specialty services and capable of dealing with more complex patients. So specifically, we looked at the prospective hospital-based trauma registries that were there from October 2015 to December 31st, 2018. The registry at Grady has obviously been a long-standing project, part of the trauma designation. The one at San Juan de Dios was actually implemented by Dr. Boeck in that first year of the Bolivian Trauma Surgical Initiative. So this was their kind of assessment of how this has gone for the hospital at San Juan de Dios. And they really, because they hadn't had a registry previously, they wanted to get a sense of how theirs compared to another hospital that has, you know, had a long-standing reputation with one. We did two sample independent t-tests and SAS was used. So Grady Hospital had around 14,000 patients and San Juan de Dios, 4,000. So in terms of sex characteristics, largely the same, just overwhelmingly male. And then the age of patients was, while statistically significant, clinically pretty equivalent. When we looked at injury types, so Grady certainly has a much higher penetrating injury, around 23% compared to San Juan de Dios. Our burn numbers are probably a little bit just not represented well for Grady since many of them are admitted directly to the burn service and kind of miss being on the trauma registry. In terms of transportation, we took a look at, you can see overwhelmingly patients in Bolivia actually arrive to the hospital via public transportation or private transportation. So that's usually people using a taxi or a family vehicle to get to the hospital. And that ambulances are much more rarely used. And then if you look at the time to the hospital, so Grady, we tend to have many transfers. So that sort of pulls that number up for us. But San Juan de Dios, they had over a day for the average patient to get to the hospital. And then you can see that the standard deviation is 5.6 days. So quite extended time for patients to get access to care. So out of these results, we sort of divided the significance into a few categories and came up with a plan with our collaborators in Bolivia, both at San Juan de Dios itself and then the Bolivian Health Department that oversees their hospital system. And the first was looking directly at the trauma registry itself. One was trying to intervene on the types of injuries that they saw within the registry, addressing those patient care delays, and then working on patient transportation. So in terms of the trauma registry itself, so we had implemented the registry initially in 2015. San Juan de Dios was actually one of the most successful hospitals. They had a much higher rate of patients being entered into their registry. And so we had to take back to the ground and sort of follow that registry and see where missing data was an issue. And then also the workflow of actually when a patient arrives, how was the registry being implemented? So one of the biggest things was we came up with a redesign of the registry form after interviewing the actual registrars, which are their residents that are in an epidemiology program through the hospital. They found that the forms were sort of duplicative of other forms that they had to do. So we did a full redesign, making sure to not duplicate things, really minimizing the number of questions and reducing the labor burden that was placed on the residents. And then also creating a nonprofit down there that wanted to partner to support a position for a trauma registrar that would actually visit the hospitals and help implement these things. So it's tough to see that smaller text, but basically we were able to take the registry and really minimize it into check boxes so that it took on average when we timed it, you know, two minutes for a resident to complete this, whereas the prior form was several pages and oftentimes would take, you know, 10 minutes or more for people to complete. And so there's ongoing assessment regarding how much it improves missing data and other things. So for blunt injuries, we found were overwhelming the most common, oftentimes for traffic incident. So we're working with the urban transportation department there, creating a chat application through WhatsApp, which is widely used in the country, that will allow them to track traffic incidents and specifically the locations and injuries that occur there. 
Um, and this will allow for more targeted imp improvements in their transit engineering. You know, they aren't able to implement wide um, spread of traffic lights and, and crosswalks and certain things that are costly, but they are able to target them. And so we're hoping to be able to, to map um, actual high rate, high rate um, injury locations so that we can um, potentially have a crosswalk installed if there is like consistent issues um, at certain intersections. And then for the extreme delays in, in care for patients, um, that really has been something that their department has run with um, the health department. So they're working on um, doing more capacity assessments within their health system to try and minimize um, the referrals. Um, so some of those longer pa um, patient delays were associated with people would have an open fracture and be driven by a taxi driver to a small private clinic that really doesn't have the staffing or capabilities to, to offer the patient an appropriate repair. Um, and then they would have to sit there and wait to either get another taxi to then be taken to the hospital or oftentimes um, wait for that private clinic's ambulance to drive them to the public hospital that had more resources. Um, and so there were, you know, there's cases where people have really faced um, extended delays in care that, that um, has impacted their outcomes. Um, so specifically when it comes to the, mo the mode of patient uh, transport, they are working on building their own um, ambulance system and, and the biggest um, undertaking is really trying to create a coordinated dispatch center. Um, and then Sam South, one of the prior fellows, has been, had worked um, extensively on a project they are trying to professionalize um, the, the EMT and paramedic role um, in the country because previously there were not um, standards established for those professions. Um, so when I was thinking about this project and you know how it, it sort of came into being in 2015 and, and my role during uh, my year in Bolivia, um, I was drawing this linear curve, but I realized that really, you know, this is very cyclical. So as a project builds and grows and certain things expand, we're sort of always addressing these key points. Um, so, you know, what started with capacity assessment and the trauma registry, um, they've been doing ATLS courses for providers there. Because of a high failure rate, um, we've offered preparation courses as well because it's extremely costly for um, providers there to take ATLS. Um, and so the preparation courses have, have helped with the higher passage rates. Um, and then pre-hospital system, um, is always um, something that, that Sam first tackled and, and now with the data from this project um, has kind of offered a renewed um, effort. And then we've also done some first responder courses for taxi drivers since they are often the um, ambulance drivers of Bolivia. And then um, we're hoping our application that we've built with Georgia Tech um, is slowly about to be rolled out to um, drivers in the public transport system there to record accidents and injuries. Um, so in conclusion, uh, global collaboration is vital to improve trauma care, especially in low and middle income countries where um, they continue to face a disproportionate burden of these injuries. Um, quality data can help lead the way. This was um, certainly not the most um, uh, complex analysis, but it really did help um, the, the health department in Bolivia and, and San Juan de Dios hospital itself um, really understand what, what is coming through their doors and where can they um, make interventions that can offer the, the best bang for um, limited dollars or Bolivianos. Um, and then from, from my perspective, working as a global research fellow down there, um, you know, I think it's always really important to dedicate your work towards the priorities of your global stakeholders. So um, as I spent more time there, you know, you realize that this is Bolivian's healthcare system. This is their country. I was very privileged to be a guest there. Um, and really, you know, what I was able to offer was labor and um, enthusiasm towards a project, but that it was, it was um, you know, key that I, I took my cues from them. So um, my project certainly changed, you know, the priorities I thought and the objectives I wrote out um, certainly changed over time um, as I built relationships and really understood what um, their, their priorities were. Um, and w most often um, I do think that, that something like the Bolivian Trauma and Surgical Initiative really is great because it offers this longitudinal support and relationships and self-sustaining initiatives. Um, so 
I've, I eventually left Bolivia and just went back to clinical residency two days ago, and they gave me 24 hours to come to Minneapolis. Um, and, but I'm very privileged to have Dr. Sharkingos um, be there and currently, you know, continuing these projects. Um, and then Dr. Boek, who was our initial um, fellow, has now graduated, is faculty at UCSF, and um, is excited to rejoin the projects um, as faculty. So uh, it's just been great to really see this become um, sustaining and, and um, offer uh, continued support to uh, our colleagues in Bolivia. Uh, thank you so much for your time. We actually, uh, if you want to stay up here, you finished early, so we have about two minutes if anybody has questions. Well, I just had a question about the, the ambulance. So are there ambulances and there's just not enough, or what, what is that situation? Um, so there are ambulances. They tend to be associated with the private hospitals there, and so um, people, there's not like a standard number, so people will often have the number of like a clinic in their neighborhood, um, and so the ambulance will often take them to that specific clinic. Um, but the issue is that oftentimes, you know, if you have an orthopedic injury or a more severe injury, um, you know, they don't have blood, they don't have um, the ability to offer patients repairs that have more severe injuries. And then the government facilities, do they just not really have ambulances? They they have ambulances, but they're used for transfers. And so gotcha. um, then if they're at the clinic, they can call the public hospital system to get a transfer from there. But the delays are pretty extended. So the hope is to they're creating a unified number similar to our 911 um, and then having a centralized dispatch that would hopefully. It's a crazy concept to try to wrap your head around. <laughs> yes, yeah, it is. Um, and so, you know, the taxis, plus the taxi drivers, you know, they, they, they are, are the, the fastest <laughs> means for most people, so. What a wonderful talk. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Uh, our next speaker is virtual and is Dr. Brian Schneider from Amarillo, Texas. He is the Associate Professor of Surgery at Texas Tech, and his talk is Improving Communication Between Critical Access Hospitals and Regional Trauma Centers.
We've again finished a little early if there were questions or comments. Um, I had just a couple comments because this really applies to me. When you saw that big white space in Texas, that's where I practice. And uh, this is something that uh, really hit home when COVID happened. Uh, all of the tertiary care hospitals were full with COVID patients and they weren't accepting any patients. So we had to manage all of our trauma patients in our 20 bed critical access hospital. We have four units of blood in our blood bank and our platelets are two hours away. So uh, it definitely becomes a real uh, issue and this is something that we definitely need to work on. Uh, with our transfers, a lot of times we run into a problem. We have two ambulances, and if they're both already transferring, we have to wait for them to come back, which is anywhere from a one and a half to two and a half hour drive for them to come back. And then a big problem we run into is the, the tertiary centers around us. We get a lot of pushback, like we're trying to dump extra work on them. And that's not the case, but I understand they're stressed out. They have a lot of patients. Um, but when we try to get them to accept patients that are appropriate for, for transfer, they, they're sometimes downright hostile. Um, and part of the problem is a lot of the communication happens between the ER and the accepting surgeon. So I, I always post my phone number everywhere in the ER and say, if you need to transfer a patient, call me and I will talk to them myself because I think there's some frustration when an ER doctor, as much as I love them and they, they make my life easier, um, they're trying to communicate that this patient has a, a critical need to be transferred and, and, you know, they're describing, you know, what their heart murmur sounded like and their, you know, their bowel sounds, you know, there's some, a level of frustration there. So I think that's, that's one way to help. But I, I beg of you to, you know, communicate that these, these things when we're, and I think this next talk is going to help, uh, these critical access hospitals, um, we, we, we are the Wild West. We don't, we don't have these things that, that you guys have. And when we call for help, we truly need that help. Looks like Dr. Schneider has responded here. You've made several good points. My facility is an intermediate facility, but I still experience many of the same problems. Any other questions? Okay, next, we're honored to have Dr. John Weigelt here, who's Professor of Surgery, University of South Dakota, Sanford School of Medicine. Dr. Weigelt will be presenting critical care in a rural setting, what is possible, what is not. Uh, no, I don't think so. Let me just uh, start by saying thank you for the invitation, Thav. Uh, and then uh, not so many thanks, Thav, for the topic that you gave me. Uh, and my first answer was very short and to the point, and it was no. And then I thought I'd walk off the podium. <laughs> but... What you just heard from our co-moderator is the problem with systematic care in the United States. And you, could al you can almost sum it up, and I, I've been doing this a lot of years, and you can almost sum it up with also one word. It's a little longer than no, but it's called communication. And the ability of that smaller hospital and that larger hospital to communicate in a collegial fashion that will allow us to obtain what we all want, and that is optimal patient care. So uh, I'm going to talk about surgical critical care in the rural setting, what is possible, what is not. And here are my objectives. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about some assumptions and definitions, and I'm going to ask you to think about a paradigm change. I'm going to talk about resources and planning, which 
has already been covered, actually. And that means then I'm going to redefine surgical critical care for all of us. When I started critical care, it was a sexy, exciting, new area. And it has evolved and evolved and evolved to where I will show you exactly what it is. And it, and it, it probably needs to be redefined a little bit. And then I'm going to make some suggestions. Uh, time constraints today, I'm going to give you uh, suggestions that are primarily based on injury. But remember, when we're talking about critical care needs of patients in a community with a smaller hospital, they can be other than injury or the condition can be other than injury. So let's go back to the American Board of Surgery. <clears throat> All surgeons who got their certificate from ABS, uh, I don't know if you've read all the fine print, but specialty of surgery is what surgical critical care is called, but it's a primary component of general surgery. It is aimed at stabilizing I didn't necessarily see, say definitively treating, but stabilizing and being able to care for acute life-threatening poten or potentially life-threatening conditions for either non-operative or operative care. Now, specialists in surgical critical care are also defined by the American Board of Surgery, and they possess advanced knowledge and skills. And that advanced knowledge and skills continues to advance as we get better and better in, in supporting or life supporting systems in people who are very, very critically ill. So there are various types of ICUs based on patient population. And yet in the adult world, we've done a pretty poor job of identifying severity of injury <clears throat> for the various levels of care. Neonatal ICUs do this much better and, and are very rigid in, in what is required and what is needed. In adults, Society of Critical Care, you can find three levels. They're defined up there. They go all the way from you know, a little bit of monitoring, short-term ventilation to where a little longer ventilation, uh, and then finally that level three where the technology and staff become intensive, it's 24-7, and that's kind of what we think about when we think about critical care. And in reality, I would tell you that critical care can be redefined in what I think is a more continuum of care that starts with perioperative care and runs itself all the way up through this technological world that we call our ICUs today. So I'm going to offer some suggestions as, as we go through a bunch of common scenarios. Some of the other assumptions I'm going to take today is that I will not address ICU design or capacity. I will not address the models of care, open, closed, mixed. I will basically agree that 24-7 coverage in a, in a critical care concept is not possible in the rural setting, and specialists in surgical critical care are not going to be present. But surgeons who are trained in critical care are. I will say that general surgeon is available to most communities, not all, but most. And there are also other health care providers that can be taxed, tapped if a proper plan is put into place. And sometimes there's even medical specialists in those smaller communities. So people. This is really team care, and building your team is what this is all about. You get buy-in from your community, your medical professionals that are available. I would tell you that there are lots of healthcare professionals may live in your community, may not work in your community, but might be willing to participate in a community effort to provide what I would call 
critical care. You need some technology, okay? You don't need a lot of technology, but you do need some technology. And you need an environment that's conducive to support such a team. That means you need the administration to buy in on this. And sometimes the administration is, is your worst enemy, uh, but it's got to be part of the team. The number of beds, they can make that decision, but the real decision that they need to make is are they going to support the educational needs of a team that's going to assume a little bit more than they're used to assuming? And then, obviously, they're, they're the ones who are going to foot the bill for the technology. Now, this is really about defining scope of rural surgical critical care. Uh, and I'm going to refer back to that level one, two, and three. And I'm going to define rural critical care as 1.5. How's that? Okay. Okay. Uh, the resources are, not, are more than capable, I think, of providing level one. and not capable of providing level three. But I think if you focus on acute, life-threatening, or potentially life-threatening surgical conditions from the ABS definition, you come up with a 1.5 level of care. And I would call that extended perioperative care, if you want, or if you want to get sexy, call it critical care. You need to consider the scope similar to trauma center levels. Uh, every trauma center, whether it be one to four, has to decide on their scope of care. We've been doing this for years. I've been doing it for more years than I would like to admit. Okay, But you need to get your team together and you need to define the scope of your practice for your rural hospital and your community needs. What surgical procedures should be done? What procedures can be emergently done? What needs to be temporized? What surgical conditions do you commonly see? And what resources do you need to provide optimal care? for the patients that you decide fit into your scope of care. And don't forget perioperative complications, because if you're going to assume some of this responsibility, you have to consider that too. So level 1.5, close monitoring, cardiopulmonary support, monitoring cardiopulmonary uh, physiology, including mechanical ventilation. You stabilize those patients that you you can, can take care of, but those that are beyond the scope, you work to stabilize them and move them to a higher level of care appropriately with proper communication before 3 o'clock in the morning occurs when you have to make the transfer. Telehealth may help. We, we've learned a lot about telehealth in, this, in, in our last, in this pandemic we're, we're coming out of now, but EICUs do exist, and sometimes they can be helpful. You need to be careful what you're buying into uh, as being a tele, uh, an EICU director at one time. It can get hairy very quickly. The ABS focus, remember, take your life-threatening or potentially life-threatening injuries, and we're going to talk about true trauma injury today. And and I believe this allows you to change this conundrum of surgical critical care to the scope of perioperative care or peri-injury care. And this, I believe, is the purview of your general surgeon in that community, as well as the team that he or she puts together. And you really need the, to support the cardiopulmonary system short term in that 1.5 model. And we all know how to do that. We've all done that. And as long as you properly scope it, I believe that many patients can be maintained in a community system without transferring 
to the higher level of care. I will tell you, as, as the person who has worked now in both areas, at, as the level one trauma surgeon, it's embarrassing for me to take a patient who's been transferred for suspect reasons and discharge the patient the next day and try to have to explain that to the family uh, that has just traveled, you know, 100 miles to basically be told that, well, you didn't really need to be here. We don't tell them that quite, but they, they, they figure that out pretty quick. So anyway, this is this also about your community, your patients, and the families that you have to interact with. So, and once you define the scope, then your transfer patients become that much easier. So, here's where I would start if I'm going to do my 1.5. Talk about your monitoring capability, your people, what's your local expertise, what devices do you need, uh, and how are you going to get the education if needed for those devices. And then you can break it down into the systems. And like I said, I'm going to concentrate today on injury. So I'm going to talk a little bit about respiratory and a little bit about neurologic. So possible or not? Possible. Prevention of pneumonia <clears throat> or treatment of pneumonia depends upon the severity of the pneumonia, obviously. But prevention, you got to have a plan if you're going to keep some of these patients you know, who are going to have short-term intubation. You're going to have to have an idea of how how you're going to manage those patients from an intubation and extubation standpoint. We all know the longer you keep somebody intubated, the greater the risk of pneumonia. So one of your goals will be how quickly can you safely extubate anybody who you're going to keep on short-term mechanical ventilation. I'm going to talk about taco and trolley a little bit, but anybody with hypoxemia, you, 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 you need to have the ability to secure an airway. You need to have the ability to do short-term ventilation. Obviously, the not, somebody with underlying, severe underlying COPD, pulmonary hypertension, you're not going to have the, the, the if you will, the, the support mechanisms to take care of those patients. And the one pneumonia that you got to be careful about is the necrotizing pneumonia. Now, what about taco and trolley? Favorite topic that is totally confused many times by many people. So taco is transfusion-associated circulatory overload. It's part of an, an iatrogenic problem created by that person that sees you in the mirror every morning, okay? Uh, it's too much fluid. You can recognize it by a chart review, or you can recognize it by just realizing that you're, you've hung the 18th liter of lactated ringers, and you're wondering why the patient can't, can't oxygenate their blood. So you slow the fluids, and you diurese the patient. On the other hand, transfusion-related acute lung injury is just what it is. It, it's an a, a, acute lung injury that can lead to ARDS, progressive hypoxemia, and those patients are going to outweigh, out uh, extend your capabilities pretty quickly. So, how do you tell the difference? It's pretty easy if you look at the X-ray. Uh, the one X-ray is is consistent with fluid overload, and the other X-ray is may even be normal early, but they're hypoxemic. They have uh, slowly developing diffuse in infiltrates. So you, you, you got to differentiate between the two, and uh, the one you can easily treat and should be treated, the other one probably needs to be moved to your higher level of care. Okay, let's talk about some favorites of mine from a, uh, from a trauma standpoint. And I'm going to make the assumption that your hospital has a CT scanner. I mean, you know, we don't have phones in the hospital anymore, pay phones in the hospital anymore, but getting a CT scanner is, was almost as, as, as easy as using the phone when you came into the hospital. Uh, but so let's make that assumption. And if the hemodynamics are okay and you have a, a, 
a blunt torso injury with liver or spleen, anywhere from grade one to three, there's no reason that that patient cannot be cared for in your community, even without blood. The majority of those patients, if they come in hemodynamically normal, are going to stay hemodynamically normal. And we know that from the natural history of these, these injuries, and yet we still see them being transferred to a higher level of care. The aorta, my favorite. Those are the ones that I discharge the next day after they've been transferred. A grade one to two, which is an intimal defect, not a pseudoaneurysm. The clear, the natural history of those, give them a little aspirin, follow them up, send them to me if you don't want to do the follow-up for follow-up as an outpatient. In two weeks, we'll get the repeat CT scan, but you could get the repeat CT scan too. Uh, and there's really nothing to be done for those patients anymore. And yet they are very commonly transferred uh, because nobody's really thought through the process. Penetrating injury depends upon your surgeon, local capability. You could stabilize and transfer. How about not blunt four to five? Get rid of them. There, there's no reason for you to worry about them. And the same thing with aorta, grade three or four. Get rid of them. They're, they're, they're the ones that will give you trouble. Sir, I just want to give you a two-minute warning because you're sure. all, we're, we're letting you go to 20 because we love you and respect you so much. Okay. And the penetrating multiple injuries, especially abdomen, get, get rid of them. Now, another favorite, and I'll finish this one up. The, the mild TBIs that get transferred are amazing. Uh, but remember that current guidelines, no CT scanning are even necessary for grade one and two, which is confusion only and associated amnesia. Uh, observe for four hours, no change, discharge. And if you've got a CT scan that's available, any grade other than that, scan and then make a decision. The moderate to severe, transfer, and spinal cord injury because there's so much so much uh, angst about that, I would transfer that as well. So other considerations, who can help? What can your community provide? Ask these questions, what, who, how, and when? Communication is essential, and it has to be done ahead of time, not at 3 a.m. 3 in the morning. Transfer distance, you just heard from friends in, in West Texas, that, that does make a difference. And you always got to remember to place the patient first. So can it be done in redefining critical care? Yes. But you need to plan and you need to choose your battles because you want to provide optimal care for your patients. Thank you very much. This next speaker, I am super excited to introduce to you because he is my dad. Will Chaplo is a partner at the International Pre-Hospital Medicine Institute, the di former director of performance improvement for the American College of Surgeons, and he was the chief of the Chicago Heights Fire Department and manager of emergency services and disaster. And for those of you who don't know, Chicago Heights is not the nice part of Chicago. Okay. Thanks, Tracy. Um, first of all, thanks to the college and particularly um, the moderators for bringing me here to talk to you today. Um, I'm especially glad I was here to see the previous presentations and not doing this remotely because uh, some of the things I'm going to say now have changed a bit or at least will be emphasized differently because of the previous presenters. Um, and great to see Dr. Weigelt again. I think the first time we were on a panel together was in Hong Kong. So it's, it's great to be working with you again. One of the things that comes out in here, and I think it's important, the conversation we're going to have right now, is because you've heard the word communication brought up several times. Uh, I think in trauma care, uh, in rural settings in particular, systems matter. And if systems are going to function properly, communications is going to be really important. And then the other factor then, of course, are all the players. Are they trained to do the jobs that they are there to do? And it's not just training, but experience. For instance, on the EMS side in rural settings, largely volunteer. Um, their experience may be broad over periods of time, but not broad from day to day. 
uh, and as you know, you know, see one, do one, teach one, repeat. Uh, if you're not seeing a lot of cases, it's difficult in the field too. So the important thing here is to understand the value of that system. And what I'm going to talk about here is does education work, for instance, in improving that communication and the way that the system works together? Because it matters to you that the system functions properly so you've got the right patient in the right place at the right time and that everybody functions together or patients will not do as well. Um, so we're going to look at, if we look at the problem itself, what, what is different about rural settings that makes us have to spend this time on it? Uh, there's a paper Sarah Smith did at Georgia uh, Southern University to look at uh, the problem. Less, the things that are important, we talk about who's out there to do the work. Less than 10% of healthcare workforce, well, workforce, excuse me, practice in rural communities. About 19.3% of the U.S. population lives in rural areas. So again, this is an interesting thing about the United States. A lot of times people watch TV that live in other countries, for instance, and they say Chicago's all big cities or uh, the United States is all big cities like Chicago. But most people in America still live in rural settings, and you look at it in this suburban to rural type settings. And in these cases, um, resources are thin. Isolation rural areas leaves residents that need to travel farther for health care. Uh, so this is going to be something also that considers for follow-up. It's going to be difficult, and you find problems with compliance if people are too far. 76% of Americans living in rural areas lacked access to immediate emergency medical care. 76%. And that makes a big difference. And we talk about time, and time is going to be one of the things we talk about in this talk today. Um, for instance, the American model for EMS response has always been if we can do it and get there in less than eight minutes, it's going to make a difference. Subsequently, studies have shown not every patient does it make a difference, but they show that it does make a difference if it's 30 minutes or an hour versus 8 minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And that's what we're looking at in these rural settings. Nearly one-sixth of all Americans live in a rural area. Nearly 50 million people live more than one hour away from the closest level one or level two. So we're in that area where we're already in a bad spot. <laughs> So we want the system to work appropriately. We want communications to be appropriately. Things like you've heard in previous talks about under and over triage. These are big problems. Patients that don't go to the right place because uh, they weren't triaged up. And on the other hand, patients that didn't need to be triaged up. Think about the way that, for instance, if we transfer in a rural setting that has one ambulance to a place that's two hours away, there's nobody covering that town or it might be somebody from two hours from there. You know, so making sure that we use the limited resources appropriately, communications and training might be able to help, and we're going to look at that. Even in some of the level trauma four centers in these places, the emergency department might be staffed with family care physicians, might include full-time and part-time staffing models, including the use of mid-level practitioners or residents. Now, again, this doesn't mean the care can't be exceptional, but it means that we have to look at our audience, make sure that they've been trained and communicated to appropriately. In this study here, uh, online study in epidemiology, uh, the authors looked at time to definitive care among severely injured farmers in this instance. So rural settings, farmers, um, is, are they getting care, are they having issues with how long it takes to get to them? The purpose was to determine whether severely injured farmers presenting to a statewide trauma system face delays in reaching definitive care compared to other severely injured workers. Population-based observational study, they used the Iowa Trauma Registry, which has been around for a while, and they looked at the period of 2005 to 2011. Their results were 748 severe occupational injuries were identified, and 21% of them were farm-related. Farm, did I say farm-related? Farm-related? Farm-related. The overall median time to definitive care was nearly an hour longer for the farmers. When adjusted for confounders, farm status remained a significant predictor of delay, but only in that first hour, which again gets us to when we're talking about trauma, that first hour is what we're most concerned about. They concluded that farm-related injuries accounted for more than one of every five severe occupational injuries entered into the Iowa trauma system and found severely injured farmers had delays in reaching definitive care, even when adjusted for the confounding factors. So the effect was most pronounced uh, in that first hour. Response time threshold for predicting outcomes. Uh, this uh, study, while it's not about trauma, uh, looks to, is there a difference with critical? There are a lot of studies done, for instance, um, looking at does it make a difference how fast we get to the patients? 
and then subsequently how fast they get to the hospital. And as I mentioned earlier, it looked like there wasn't like a whole lot of support for this eight to 10 minute range that people kind of standardize on in urban areas. Um, but it did start to show that there were problems with patients at a half hour and an hour in general. And also that patients that were critical did do better if we actually got to them in three to four minutes. So there are time factors depending on criticality, also depending on um, how long it will ultimately take. So they looked at this, and these are cardiac arrests, so they're not trauma. They actually excluded trauma in this study. Um, it's a Taiwanese study published in 2021, so it's current, um, or at least one of the newer studies that you can find. They did a retrospective observational analysis. Um, admittedly, that's always going to be um, a limiting factor, but they did look at the data that they were able to get. They looked at 6,742 of the 10,933 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests. Um, after excluding patients under 18, burn trauma, drowning, DNR, people with DNR orders, uh, they had a fairly broad exclusion category there. They found response times of 6.2 minutes or less were statistically and significantly associated with survival to hospital discharge. They also reported that if the arrest occurred at a public place or bystander CPR was performed, that threshold rose to 7.2 and 6.3 minutes respectively. And again, this keeps coming out increasingly in the literature. If somebody is there to do something when the injury occurs or the, the critical illness occurs, uh, the outcomes improve significantly. That's why the Stop the Bleed program has gotten so much attention um, because when you're bleeding profusely, there's no time at all. And then if the person that's there, it's like Sen said, the, the uh, most important person to a trauma victim or an injured victim is going to be the person who applies the first dressing. And that's going to be the same case here. Shorter response times do make a difference, specifically in these out-of-hospital cardiac arrests in this study. Uh, while, again, it a, were medical situations, they were full arrests, uh, it does point out the importance in critical patients that time plays. It contributes to a growing number of studies that show that time is a factor. This particular study looked at the challenges of optimal trauma care in rural family physicians in Kansas. In this study, uh, what it points out is what we talked about earlier and some of the other presenters have talked about as far as the importance of communication. Kansas has got a regionalized trauma system. The authors of this study hypothesized that improved communication with rural providers throughout the system could facilitate system process improvement. They created a focus group of rural Kansas family physicians that were recruited at a family medicine symposium. Seven rural family medicine providers participated in this focus group. All of these providers saw patients in the ED treating victims of falls, motor vehicle collisions, and farming injuries. So it was relevant that they were actually seeing these patients. The participants identified success in adopting and enforcing standardized processes, specifically working with level four trauma centers and gaining certifications and advanced trauma life support training. So the key takeaway here is what the previous presenters were talking about as far as communications. If people understand the system better, or understand their role in the system, and the importance of following protocols appropriately, we can have a better outcome. Now, rural trauma has come up a couple of times, the uh, rural trauma team development course. And this course is interesting because it's probably the only course that I'm aware of. Uh, when you teach the course, frequently the room is full of hospital administrators, nurses, surgeons, EMS people. It kind of goes across the board. So it really promotes the function and communication of a system. And many of the, the feedback uh, that you hear when you come out of these talk about people understand, not understanding how important their role was or why people ask them for the things that they ask for or how they can report things better. So this particular study looked at, you know, is this going to uh, shorten the interval of patient transfers decisions? They looked at level three and four trauma centers. Uh, were enrolled in a multi-institutional three-month longitudinal study of transferred trauma patients. Then those results were compared with institutions that had RTDDC courses uh, versus those that had not. Results indicated that the training alone, and including uh, communication training piece, resulted in statistically significant shorter time for decision to transfer. Transferring squad arrival time was also significantly reduced, as was the number of transferring squads contacted. No differences were observed among the trauma family, excuse me, tra trauma facilities and the number of receiving facilities contacted, or in the time it took to find one. So and again, in this case, the very thing we've been talking about, if we can train and communicate better, 
we're going to have a higher compliance with protocol and patients will do better. So in this case, they said that, yes, RTDC was effective in this particular outcome. Now, training again. Now, we talked about experience and training levels of people. Dr. Ali, these studies are old. I will certainly accept that. But of the studies that are out there, they're interesting because it specifically looked at an environment where there was very little training and looked at the outcomes of trauma patients in that setting before they were trained. And then what was evaluated before and after the study was not just the outcomes of the patients, but the compliance with delivery of specific skills to life-saving, bleeding control, opening the airway, protecting the patient from further injury. And what they found in all these cases is that outcomes did statistically, and they ruled it as significant improvement, and the change in compliance or the ability to perform skills went in some cases from lower than 50% compliance to over 100%, not over, 100%. So it had a significant result. And then the study was also done with ATLS in that atmosphere. So training works in getting people to do the best they can within the guidelines. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is another study was done to try to replicate Dr. Ali's results in the Middle East, and they were able to replicate the studies, had similar results in that environment. So I would show the older studies just because it was something that a lot of us based what we were trying to do educationally, and a subsequent study was able to have the same result. Now, this one is interesting because it looks further at what we can achieve if we build the systems, if we communicate, and if we educate all the players within that system so that they understand their role and the importance of doing things in a way that follow within that guideline. Here they looked at a review of the types of patients seen in rural communities, the volume of these patients, and the destination protocols used in rural communities as taught by the ACS ATLS, and the implications of the CDC guidelines for field triage of injured patients. Recommendations of the National Expert Panel on field triage reviewed, assessed, and compared to the needs in rural areas for a rural trauma system. In addition, a quality assessment tool was used for a major trauma center, whereby the frequency of patients transported to the center that were inappropriate for trauma center was indicated by the volume that were discharged in six hours. The results were that most of the patients injured in rural communities can be treated in the critical access in rural hospital, over 90%, and can be provided with good care without the need for emergency medical service transportation long distances to trauma centers. And this is kind of what we were talking about earlier, the danger of over triage. You know, if we are triaging patients to take up reduced resources, that means the transporting agency, that means the team that has to assess that patient, all this stuff is putting resources in a place where they could have done better elsewhere. So in this case, inappropriate use of EMS vehicles, thus circumventing families having to travel long distances, can be reduced if we do these things. Triage criteria can be taught as per EMS systems, training given to rural hospitals, personnel, hospital administrators, instructed as to the benefit of such a system. All of them would be interest and have an investment in making sure that these things work more appropriately. Their conclusion was only 5% to 10% of trauma injuries require the resources of a trauma center. And I think that's pretty much consistent with what the other presenters have showed here today. Proper triage and medical provider education can be used for the benefit of the patient. In the EMS system, the rural and urban hospital, and proper quality assurance to assure the right patient is treated at the right hospital at the right time. This is a very simple statement that we use a lot. You want the right patient at the right place at the right time. All those things are important. Oh, it's great, because I'm dressed right about there. Rural areas present challenges in trauma care, to summarize. Organized systems can assure resources are optimized and gaps identified, and training can improve communication, compliance of protocols, guidelines, and reduce over and under triage, which are, they kill us at multiple levels. You know, when we're looking for resources, if we're over triaging a lot and wasting those resources, it's hard to get the resources we want and where we want them. First presentation today talked about ambulances, and I've done a lot of work in Latin America, and that's pretty much the standard. There's a lot of ambulances out there, but they're all kind of contracted to specific medical groups, so their transport system is a mess. So when you do work there, you have to figure out how do we deal with the reality of this environment. And as many of you go out to your communities and elsewhere, don't start out with saying, here's what I did here, do it just like this. 
but do an evaluation of the ground you just landed on, find out what they've got, and figure out how they get to where you want to be, principles versus preferences. You know, there's ways that we know that work or things that must be done, but they will be done differently depending on the resources in the atmosphere. Thank you very much for your time. We did have a comment for Dr. Weigel from Dr. Epstein. She said that, thank you for accepting the challenge. Coming from the true and original wild, wild west in rural Colorado, a few of the solutions, technology and manpower implemented are central cloud application and imaging centers that host shared imaging studies, which allow remote access from anywhere in real time. We also optimize remote telehealth solutions from level one trauma centers to enable access and share imaging studies and other information. The biggest and most recent game changer in the wild, wild west mountains at 8,000 plus altitude has been implementation of Starlink SpaceX by Elon Musk, which although expensive for some for initial implementation, $600 for hardware total cost and then $99 a month, allows very high speed internet access. We also partner with local law enforcement, EMS, and various hospitals to provide life flight support with competent teams for transfer. Community education is also critical such that everyone understands when, who to contact in life-threatening circumstances. Our community also relies on social media and the majority of our population, including elderly, participate on Facebook for messaging and community education from search and rescue, sheriff's department, et cetera. We're going to try to move along, and we'll save some of the questions towards the end or during the break if we don't have enough time. Next, Saptarshi Biswas, attending trauma surgeon, Department of Trauma, Acute Care Surgery, and Surgical Critical Care at the Grand Stand Strand Medical Center in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Trauma recidivism in a rural ACS level and trauma center. Has the paradigm shifted? So good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity here. So my name is Shukhtar Shibiswas. I'm uh, presently based in Myrtle Beach. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, trauma recidivism. It's like uh, the repeat offenders. And at uh, end of the day, they also have like a significant role to play in the resources. And a um, lot of resources have been lost because of this uh, trauma recidivism. Most of the uh, studies previously were aimed at uh, young trauma patients like trauma patients were um, previously thought to be uh, young with penetrating injuries, with alcohol influence and substance abuse and stuff like that. Um, we try to basically look at um, our population, which is uh, a rural center in, uh, uh, in, in Muttle Beach. Uh, Muttle Beach is one of the centers there. In fact, like uh, it consists uh, of five counties. One of the main counties is Horry County where Muttle Beach is uh, located. Uh, it becomes totally different during uh, summertime when, like, lots of tourists, more than, like, 20 million people comes in there and makes it a different center. But the point of the study is that, like, we took into account people who are based in uh, Horry County and the five adjoining counties. So they are, like, indigenous people of the county and not the tourists. And um, the way we got to it was by looking at the zip codes and stuff like that. So we took out the tourists from this equation. So this was a study which was started some time back by my uh, one of my predecessors, and um, I just completed this. Um, I thought like uh, this was uh, important. So this is like some of my uh, colleagues and uh, medical students who helped with this project completion. I have nothing to disclose. I belong to this HCA hospital, and so uh, every every slide, every uh, picture, everything has been scrutinized and. Uh, to present. So background, um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, trauma recidivism, which is like uh, repeat offenders in a way, which is like uh, patients who have been admitted for trauma and then comes back again with uh, different trauma. And so those are the people I'm going to talk about. And uh, in a rural uh, in a center, um, our center is one of the five level one trauma centers in South Carolina. And uh, as I said before, like uh, this uh, consists of five uh, important counties. The important of them is like the Horry County, which uh, has the Myrtle Beach here. 
So uh, we looked at the elderly population because previously um, uh, there are lots of studies which have looked at um, the difference between recidivism in the urban population versus rural population and also um, mostly in the urban population and also in the young generation because where the trauma was more uh, prominent, especially, as I mentioned, with penetrating trauma, gunshots and uh, uh, firearms and stuff like that. Um, we looked at the people who are elderly people. And interestingly, because of the reason that like we have a significant amount of people who are in the elderly age group. And uh, in fact, like 22% of our population is in the elderly age group, which is 65 and above. And we looked at those specifically uh, people who are in the 65 and above group and compared them with uh, people who are between 18 and uh, 64 and we found out a significant difference that like uh, recidivism exists also in this age group and uh, there have been like significant increase from the national uh, numbers. So we found out that trauma recidivism in the elderly people is strongly related to mostly because of functional loss from their injuries because they are frail, they have like uh, underlying comorbidities and also from the socioeconomic uh, challenges after this initial injury. And most of them are not able to uh, go back to their normal life after the initial injury. Also, there's increased uh, healthcare expenses and resources, which they are not able to cope up with, and of high uh, mortality rate and high morbidity rates. Orderly are also the fastest growing segment of the population, not only in uh, our state, but uh, throughout the country. There are like 42 million people all over US who are gonna be um, like above 65 and then they're gonna be doubling uh, in like 2030. And um, most of them are active and uh, so they live a longer life. Our healthcare system has improved. So they all help in living these people a normal healthy life. And as you grow older and longer life, like we have the more chances of having injuries and uh, motor vehicle accidents, trauma and uh, falls and everything. So an uh, increased risk for exposure to traumatic injuries as we grow older. So there's a need for better understanding of this trauma recidivism for this at-risk population. Um, and I'm, we are gonna basically talk about this uh, population which are progressively getting older and I'm 65 and above. So this is like a snapshot of our uh, county. And the one in red is the Hori County, which is the main uh, focus of our uh, discussion. And this is the one which uh, lodges the Myrtle Beach area. And there are like five adjoining uh, areas around it. As I said, like our hospital is the Grandstand Hospital, which uh, is the level one trauma center, which covers a very wide area and the nearest level uh, one is like more than three hours away. Uh, there are like a couple of uh, other hospitals which are level two and then a couple of level three hospitals and which also share our button. But we are the main uh, referral center around this area. And um, a small geography here, like 1134 square miles consisting of the Grandstand where the hospital is named after and uh, the uh, adjoining rural areas. So this is, as I said, like uh, a study which was done from 2013 to 2017. And uh, the population dynamics were somewhat different and we are doing a second part of this uh, study now. Um, so we, as I mentioned, like uh, there was 22% of uh, population that time was above uh, 65 years of age and which was significantly higher, was like 1.3 uh, times higher than the rest of the South Carolina um, area and then 1.5 times higher than the rest of the US on average. So we had like a, a significant number of uh, elderly people. Part of them were like uh, snowboarders who had moved over from different parts of the country and uh, come and settle down there called uh, Myrtle Beach their home. And um, as I mentioned, 18 million people normally come in during the summertime. And obviously I haven't uh, taken into account those because like um, we have only consider the people who are resident of the uh, county. So hypothesis, like there was a con uh, hypothesis which had like combination of patient dem um, demographics and the injury characteristic that suggested that like older people and elderly people above the 65 age group were uh, also part of the recidivism compared to like previous thoughts. So we did this retrospective four um, year study um, consisting of local um, grandstand uh, patients who are like more than 18 years of age with a history of trauma and trauma recidivism and admissions uh, during this four year time period. Obviously the exclusion criteria was pretty uh, clear. We excluded everybody uh, below the age of 18 who never survived after the initial trauma 
and then like um, any other uh, that we could not be documented factors that could not be documented. The trauma uh, grandstand database was used for this and specific ICD-10 queries were uh, tabulated. As I said, like the target population was uh, 65 and above age group and the comparison, uh, the control group was the people who were below 65 between 18 and 64 age group. So we had during this time, this uh, 2013 to 2017, around about 10,920 uh, patients, which are significantly increased now, like this year only, like we had like more than 4,500 trauma patients. Um, but during this time, like it was 10,920 patients and uh, the recidivism was 4.2, which was significantly um, almost um, higher um, than most places because the country um, has a recorded number of like 1.2 to 5 percent is the incidence of uh, trauma recidivism. This is almost up there, like 4.2. And um, interestingly, um, the trauma recidivism ages in the 18 to 64 age group, where the number was 240, was 3.4. And uh, if you take into account the uh, patient's age between 65 and above, which is 182, and the percentage was 6.3, which is, as you can see, like significantly higher from the national uh, percentage. And this was uh, significantly higher, 1.94 times that time of the recidivism, like uh, everywhere. And most common mechanism of injury was the fall, as you can expect from people uh, 64 and above age group. So de demographics of these uh, patients between uh, 18 years to 64 and uh, 65 and above. So this is a bit uh, crowded, but if you can see there, like um, in the age between the 65 and above and the 65 and below age group, there's like 44.3 and then 79.5. And then uh, the important thing that we found out was that um, female was significant part in this age group as far as the 64 and above was concerned. And uh, the mechanism, as you can expect, was the blunt mechanism that was uh, there in the uh, age group. And um, as far as the length of stay in the hospital was concerned, the length of stay was more in the blunt uh, injury and the falls in the elderly age group. And uh, uh, ICU stay and ICU ventilation and um, was more or less on equal part. They were not clinically significant in this both uh, these age groups. What was different and which was, we found out interesting was that like uh, in the younger age group and the so-called younger age group between 18 to 64, we found out like uh, people um, or patients died more during this time. And the people who, um, um, in the 65 and above age group literally survived more compared to the 64 and, um, and below age group. Those were like a multifactorial reasons for that. Um, although like the ISS of the people in the 64 and above age group was significantly higher compared to the ISS of the people um, in the other age group. The GS, uh, GCS was more or less the same in both the age groups. Um, this is obvious from uh, our uh, patient data that like uh, more patients were sent home in the younger age group as you can expect and more patients in the elderly age group went to SNF, to LTAC, to nursing homes, to the home with home healthcare. So um, as I said, like uh, recent times, like lots of studies have been focusing on elderly uh, trauma and geriatric trauma in particular. And so, so we wanted to look into those. And we found out that um, there have been separate studies which are looking into specific reasons of the fall. And we found out like uh, uh, people with ground level falls or even like uh, fall downstairs with uh, minimal head injuries, they are the ones who are prone to have second falls and stuff like we are trying to build up another study and uh, follow up on those. So to conclude, mm -hmm. well, we found out like uh, in the elderly age group, trauma is recurrent and as I said with poor health outcomes and it does cause a significant burden on the healthcare because of the loss of resources and stuff like that. And this is multifactorial as you can see, um, the frailty and uh, the loss of job from this uh, elderly population, they're never able to go back to their normal uh, lifestyle again and all of us have a, like a significant burden on our health system. Thank you, thank you for your time.
we're going to go ahead and move on with the next presentation. Yeah, we're, a, we're a little early, but we're going to march ahead so we get back on schedule. Uh, our next speaker, Dr. Peter Pons from Brighton, Colorado, is the Professor Emeritus, Department of Emergency Surgery, University of Colorado School of Medicine, and quite literally one of the smartest men I've ever met in my life. Hello, thank you for joining. My name is Dr. Peter Pons. I am an emergency physician in Denver, Colorado. Perhaps nowhere is the issue of a continuum of care more important than when it comes to rural trauma. As you can see, the death rate from trauma, unintentional injury in the rural setting is 50% higher compared to the urban rate. Um, the good news, if there is some, is that between in the decade between 2006 and 2015, rural traffic fatalities decreased by a quarter um, and alcohol impaired driving fatalities decreased by almost a third. And daytime seatbelt use uh, was noted to be about 85%, which was similar to the urban setting. Unfortunately, the bad news, however, is that the overall fatality rate continues to be higher in the rural setting compared to the urban setting. And the majority of those occur at the scene, which is perhaps not surprising, but there are some issues that we will discuss to perhaps address that. If we look at occupant fatalities, half of those victims were unrestrained. And when it comes to pickup truck accidents, 60% uh, of those occupants were unrestrained. Well, if we take a look at a CDC report, there are several factors that are present in the rural setting that contribute to these death rates. First is the issue of distance. Um, EMS obviously in many cases has to travel a much longer distance to access the injury site. And then the distance from the incident location to the nearest medical facility is significant. And then when we talk about medical expertise, uh, unfortunately, for all levels of medical providers, both pre-hospital and hospital, the expertise that we have um, in the rural setting just does not duplicate that located in the urban setting and particularly at the trauma centers. So let's talk about distance first. Um, the traditional continuum of care for the trauma victim in the rural setting looks like this. The incident happens, uh, it has to be discovered, local EMS has to be notified and respond to that scene. The patient is transported to the local emergency department where the initial care is provided by the physician in that department. Um, if they recognize the urgency of the situation, the surgeon is notified and responds, and a decision is made about whether or not that patient is gonna be managed locally or if that individual needs transfer to a trauma center. If the goal is to improve rural trauma victim outcome, um, we have to ask ourselves a couple of questions. What does the rural trauma victim need in the time between the moment the injury occurs and the arrival of EMS? And what is the most appropriate destination for that victim? The most common cause of preventable death after trauma is uncontrolled hemorrhage. And as I know everyone in this room is well aware, that can be internal or external. Internal hemorrhage can basically only be accomplished uh, and controlled in the operating room. External hemorrhage typically is controlled by EMS. Now to expand the continuum of care, we need to expand the cadre of people who are capable of providing external trauma control. And ideally that would be done by the first person who arrives at the scene and not await EMS's arrival. That can be the citizen first responder. It might be the local police officer. Um, we, we need to think of external hemorrhage control in the same terms as we think about CPR. We have done a great job over the last roughly 30 years of promoting citizen CPR, 
Um, we now are promoting citizen hemorrhage control with the advent of the bleeding control courses that are available. The Hartford Consensus recognized this issue uh, in their publications uh, regarding improving survival from active shooter events. And they specifically stated, care of the victims is a shared responsibility between law enforcement, fire rescue, and EMS. The notable addition here being law enforcement, and that has since further been expanded to include the immediate responder, the bystander, the formerly termed bystander, if you will, who is present at a scene and who can act immediately if they are empowered and trained. Then we have the professional first responders and then the trauma professionals. The goal of the Hartford consensus is to empower the public to provide emergency care. Um, and training the immediate responder, as I mentioned, uh, is now happening with a number of courses uh, that promote the entire concept of stop the bleed, stop the hemorrhage. Uh, one of these courses is offered by the American College of Surgeons. There are a number of other organizations as well that offer these courses, but they are all designed to empower that first person that gets to the scene of a traumatic injury to recognize life-threatening external hemorrhage and make attempts to stop it. Um, frankly, it's not just related to motor vehicle incidents. There are a host of other potential hazards, everyday events that can produce trauma and hemorrhage and in the home, in the workplace. And ideally, if this had been done uh, with some forethought, we would combine bleeding control training with CPR training and do both at the same time. Hemorrhage control training. Um, while many people think of these courses as tourniquet courses, they're not. The thing we have to get across is that external hemorrhage control, uh, the first step requires direct pressure and no special equipment. This can be done by anybody. Uh, we were given two hands and applying direct pressure uh, will be beneficial in most cases. If the supplies and equipment are available, such as tourniquets, wound packing material, hemostatic dressings, then in fact, we can use those as well. And the Stop the Bleed courses all teach these three techniques. The CDC report, let's, if, we, if we go back to that, talks about distance and medical expertise. A little bit more about distance. Um, distance and time to a trauma center are a barrier for rural trauma patients and EMS. If air medical transport is not available, travel to a distant trauma center may take the only ambulance in the community out of service for a long period of time. And this is obviously a big problem for many of these communities that can't afford to have the ambulance out of service for a prolonged transport. Uh, if we look specifically at how close trauma centers are to much of the population, as a general statement, we can see that 90% of the population in the U.S. lives within one hour of a level one, two, or three trauma center. If we are exclusively talking about ground transport, this image shows the locations where uh, patients and individuals are within 60 minutes. It's 5% of the geographic area of the United States and 60% of the population. And no surprise, these are most of the urban areas. If we throw in air medical transport, uh, we now reach that 90% population coverage. But again, it's only one third of the geographic area that is covered by this. So there are still large portions uh, in which EMS response and transport are going to be prolonged. It's estimated that if we look at triage by EMS to a trauma center, that occurs in, third, in one third to about two thirds of all trauma patients who need a trauma center. In a study that was done by uh, Dr. Newgard, published in JAMA Surgery in 2017, he did an evaluation of rural versus urban trauma patients 
and ground transport. 44 EMS agencies, 28 hospitals, two were rural, five were urban, 50,000 patients evaluated. Um, and you can see the breakdown of patients and where they went. In terms of the urban setting, a quarter of patients went to a level one trauma center, another 7% went to a level two, and two thirds went to a non-trauma center. Um, if we look at the rural setting, the numbers are quite different. Only one and a half percent ended up at a level one trauma center versus 90 plus percent that ended up at a non-trauma center. Now, again, not all of these patients required trauma centers, um, but we'll see here in this slide that of those patients identified by EMS as needing critical resources, rural EMS identified two thirds of patients, whereas urban setting EMS providers recognized 80%. And of those in the rural setting, only one third got transported directly to a major trauma center. Whereas in the urban setting, almost 90% get transported to that major trauma center. And if we look at trauma patient deaths, um, you can see the dark column is rural settings, the lighter column is urban. Where do most of the deaths occur in the rural setting? In the out of hospital setting, as compared to the urban setting where more deaths occur uh, in the hospital, often within 24 to 48 hours after ED arrival. So let's take a look at medical ex expertise. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the rural expertise, unfortunately, the experience just is not acquired to match that that is obtained at an urban trauma center. So we need to assure that adequate knowledge is provided for both the pre-hospital and the hospital trauma care providers in the rural setting. And there are a number of educational programs to provide that training. Uh, for the pre-hospital provider, there are a number of programs that are specifically focused on trauma care uh, and what should be done for that trauma individual. International trauma life support, pre-hospital trauma life support, and essentials of trauma care. All of these courses are available they are 16 hour programs, usually given over two days, although they can be spread out if need be. They are a combination of didactic experience and practical experience. For the hospital setting, um, obviously there's the advanced trauma life support course from the American College of Surgeons. But importantly, there is the rural trauma team development course. This is an eight hour course, again, from the American College of Surgeons, designed to help rural trauma team development uh, and recognize that while resources may be limited, in fact, a small trauma team can be developed to appropriately assess a trauma victim and determine the need for transfer to a trauma center. So if we summarize this issue of a continuum of care, we need to recognize that the mortality rate for rural trauma is significantly higher than for urban trauma. Many critically injured trauma patients are still not primarily transported to a trauma center. And in the rural setting, these are logistical problems that are extremely difficult to overcome. There are educational programs out there to help expand the responder pool uh, and empower the previous bystander to now become an immediate responder and to hone the trauma skills of those who have less frequent exposure to trauma patients and improve the assessment skills and recognize the critical injuries and the need for early trauma center transfer. Those things combined will help improve survival. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your participation. Dr. Lance Stuke, Professor of Surgery, General Surgery Program Director, LSU Department of Surgery, speaking on trauma resuscitation. Another virtual talk.
Hello, I'm Dr. Lance Stuckey, Professor of Surgery at the LSU Department of Surgery in New Orleans and a trauma surgeon at the Spirit of Charity Trauma Center in downtown New Orleans. And today, I uh, will talk briefly about trauma resuscitation. And uh, it's sort of like drinking out of a fire hydrant. There's a lot to cover in a very short amount of time. So uh, let's get started. I have uh, no disclosures, no conflicts of interest. So the, the two areas we'll cover today, one is trauma resuscitation in 2021. Where are we? What is the state of the art? What uh, are some of the newer advances over the last several years that have come along? And then we'll talk about damage control surgery, what it is, what uh, techniques I find uh, that work well, and uh, some tips and tricks that uh, may help you out in a bind. So trauma resuscitation, what does that mean and what has changed over the last several years? Well, probably the biggest advance in resuscitation is in how we do it and in the fluids that we give. For those who have been around in practice uh, longer than about uh, 15 years or so, we can remember the days where a crystalloid-based resuscitation was standard of care, and this is no longer the case. Additionally, our goal was always to resuscitate to a uh, normal blood pressure to make the patient normal intensive. We don't necessarily want to do that. Our, our goal is to replace blood loss, but to maintain hypotension until surgical control of hemorrhage is achieved. So we allow a patient to uh, remain with a you know blood pressure in the 80s or 90s systolic, minimize crystalloid use, resuscitate with a one-to-one -one ratio of packed red blood cells to fresh frozen plasma. At our institution and at many other institutions, we're doing a TEG-based resuscitation, meaning uh, either we or anesthesia will draw a sample of blood, send it off, spin it down and analyze the clotting properties of the blood. And from that, we can ascertain whether the patient is thrombocytopenic, uh, whether they're fibrinolytic, uh, what are the clotting properties of the blood, and what can we give to uh, replace what they need. So instead of a shotgun approach, we try to tailor the resuscitation uh, to exactly what that patient may need, whether it be uh, plasma, cryoprecipitate, platelets, et cetera. Tranexamic acid has, is the uh, latest and greatest craze in the trauma resuscitation world. And I'll talk more about it briefly, but um, it's, it, you know, every, every few years, some new thing comes along that we think might change the face of resuscitation, and that is currently tranexamic acid. Um, I don't know that I buy it, but we will see. Pelvic binders are back in vogue. Um, for a while, they were not. We, um, we use pelvic binders to control massive hemorrhage, massive blood loss from uh, major pelvic fractures. And then Reboas, which I'll talk about uh, also. And this is another one of the latest, greatest things in trauma resuscitation that uh, a surgeon should know about, should know how to uh, utilize and deploy and, uh, and manage in a patient who is hemorrhaging. So what is tranexamic acid? It is an antifibrillinic medication. It's been around forever. It's FDA approved in gynecologic surgery, cardiac, orthopedic surgery. And uh, it has been proven to be safe and effective. And over the last 10 years or so, many trials have come out uh, involving the use of TXA in trauma resuscitation, showing that it is very effective, uh, very safe, um, but some of those trials that show the effectiveness are quite controversial. Uh, the biggest that you'll hear about is the CRASH-2 trial, the MATTERS study, which was done by the U.S. military and the British uh, military uh, from their experience in uh, the wars overseas over the last 15 years, and a lot of civilian studies as well. Have, have studied the use of tranexamic acid. Uh, the standard dosing regimen is one gram IV push uh, given 
within three hours of injury if possible, followed by one gram drip over eight hours. Uh, recent data suggests that a single two to three gram IV push may be just as effective, if not more effective. There is a very uh, good safety profile with, with tranexamic acid. There's a theoretical risk of uh, thromboembolic events, strokes, myocardial infarctions, but really those studies have not shown a, a significant amount of, uh, of serious side effects from the use of tranexamic acid. But the data does remain unclear as to whether it really makes a difference in improving mortality from a traumatic injury. There's also a role being uh, researched now for the use of TXA in the pre-hospital setting. Many of the studies have suggested that um, if TXA is given early after injury, within one to three hours of injury, that um, it has a, a it's more effic efficacious. And so there is a, a role potentially for the pre-hospital use of TXA. But once again, the data is, is all over the place and uh, very unclear. Pelvic binders are uh, now highly recommended and, and, and uh, are often utilized for open book pelvic fractures or any pelvic fracture that involves disruption of the pelvic ring. They are not indicated for all pelvic fractures, and that is a, a key point to make. We, we see uh, pelvic binders placed when EMS suspects there might be a pelvic fracture, um, but there is not a pelvic fracture or a uh, transferring hospital sends a patient with a binder in place, but the pelvic fracture pattern is either not severe enough to support the use of a binder, or even could be um, made worse by the use of a binder. And I'll show you a couple x-rays in a minute of what I'm talking about. Uh, the idea behind the binder is that it reduces pelvic volume. So in a patient with uh, significant pelvic fractures with significant hemorrhage, the, uh, the binder reduces that volume and, and uh, theoretically at least can uh, decrease the uh, hemorrhage in the pelvis. In the past, we've used sheets folded up and wrapped tightly. Those are, are definitely much less effective than uh, the commercial devices that are available now. And the key point when you're placing a pelvic binder on a patient with a major pelvic trauma is that it's placed at the level of the greater trochanter. One of the most common mistakes I see made by both EMS and uh, transferring facilities is that the binder is placed too high. It's not an abdominal binder, it's a pelvic binder. So when you place it, if it looks like it's placed too low, it's actually probably in the correct position. So remember, the, the binder is placed at the greater trochanter. And here this image demonstrates that quite nicely at the proper positioning of the binder. The fracture pattern on the left shows a clear disruption of the pelvic ring. This is exactly what uh, what I'm talking about with a correct indication for the use of a pelvic binder. The binder will close that space down and, and theoretically at least help tamponade that hemorrhage. Fracture on the left is a inferior pubic rami fracture, which in and of itself is not a significant fracture pattern. And even um, placing a binder could worsen that fracture by compressing it against itself. So uh, make sure you're, you're placing the binder for the correct indication. Another significant advance in trauma care over the last several years is the use of Reboa, or the resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta device. And surgeons who are used to placing um, central lines and arterial lines will be very comfortable with placing a Reboa catheter. It's placed in the femoral artery either on the left or the right side, and the catheter is threaded up through the iliac vessels into the aorta, and a balloon is then deployed or inflated uh, to occlude blood flow through the aorta at whichever level you uh, ultimately deploy the, uh, the reboa. Most commonly, it is either deployed uh, above the diaphragm in the descending thoracic aorta, um, and it can also be deployed lower in the aorta, just above the bifurcation in patients with severe pelvic fractures. And this is what the final product looks like once it's deployed. It has a, uh, a line that can be attached to um, an arterial uh, blood pressure monitor. So it's a great way to uh, monitor arterial pressure. And the blue catheter there is actually the Reboa itself. 
through the sheath and deployed in the uh, in the aorta. Zone one again is a super diaphragmatic deployment, and it's analogous in my mind to an aortic cross clamp that you would do if you're performing a, a thoracotomy for hemorrhage. Zone two is an area that we do not deploy the uh, Reboa balloon to, and that's a new celiac and SMA area. Zone three is lower down the infra infrarenal aorta just above the bifurcation, and this is a great place to, de to deploy the balloon um, in a patient with severe hemorrhage from pelvic fractures but no other associated intra-abdominal trauma. This preserves blood flow to the uh, organs of the abdomen but does occlude blood flow into the pelvis. On the left is an image of a zone three deployment just above the bifurcation of aorta, and on the right is zone one deployment in the descending thoracic aorta, again, analogous to a uh, aortic cross clamp in the thoracotomy. So damage control surgery is the next thing I want to talk about. And this is uh, something that's been done uh, quite commonly now for about the last 20 years. Historically, it was done in the past for severe liver hemorrhage um, in conjunction with uh, packing of the liver. It now applies to any major trauma and can be done in any body cavity. We most commonly associate damage control surgery with abdominal trauma, but we've also done uh, damage control surgery in the chest and on vascular injuries as well. And it's done in conjunction with uh, damage control resuscitation. So what it is, is a rapid entry into the abdomen or chest with a large incision, four quadrant packing, uh, with two basic principles in mind. One, control bleeding, two, control intra-abdominal uh, contamination from enteric spillage. It usually involves multiple operations with a temporary abdominal closure and is performed in conjunction with a damage control resuscitation. And the idea here is to live to fight another day. Stop the bleeding, stop the spillage, and get out and live to fight another day. What it isn't, it is not minimally invasive surgery. There's no role here for a small incision. It is not slow and precise surgery. It requires a surgeon to be quick and uh, very decisive. It is not one operation. It's most commonly two, three, even four or five operations done over the course of several days, and it is not definitive surgery. That is done at a later date. The three phases of damage control. The uh, first phase is the initial operation where the hemorrhage is controlled, enteric contamination is controlled, the abdomen is packed and temporarily closed. The patient is taken to the uh, intensive care unit for ongoing resuscitation with rewarming, correction of acidosis, reversal of shock, and then uh, workup for other injuries that could be causing uh, hemorrhage. And then the final phase is the definitive repair. So remove the packs, fix the injuries as you need to, uh, reanastomose the bowel, and close the abdomen. Indications are any patient in extremis any combined major vascular and hollow visceral injuries, major liver or pancreatic duodenal injuries, any patient requiring a massive blood transfusion requirement, or patient with other life-threatening injuries that aren't even in the abdomen, vascular injuries, thoracic injuries, neck, et cetera, or any patient that you can't close the abdomen due to edema from uh, over-resuscitation. Key steps, prep the neck all the way to the thighs, place an NG tube in a Foley catheter, Foley catheter is also diagnostic. It's not just uh, to monitor res resuscitation, it's also to evaluate for hematuria, to raise your suspicion for a, a genital urinary uh, injury. Large midline incision, be generous, siphoid to pubis. Rapid four quadrant packing, especially for blunt trauma when you may not know where the bleeding is coming from. And penetrating trauma is often a little easier to see and you go straight to the source. Um, compress the bleeding, pack it. And once you have the abdomen tightly packed, take a deep breath. Hold what you've got and allow anesthesia time to catch up and, and, and resuscitate the patient. Remove the packs sequentially, starting the farthest from where you suspect the injury has occurred. Control the hemorrhage, um, either with a removal of a solid organ or a more definitive control of, with suturing. Ligate any unnecessary vessels. I'm a big fan of shunting major vascular injuries in a patient in extremis. The Argyle shunts work great. Uh, anybody who does uh, carotid surgery knows, uh, is intimately familiar with Argyle shunts, but they work great for shunting 
the brachial artery. They're great for uh, the femoral artery as well. I love pediatric chest tubes for iliac vessel injuries. The, a, a nice 2022 French uh, pediatric chest tube fits very nicely inside an iliac artery. And then finally, control intestinal spill. Resect it. Don't worry about repairing anything and certainly do not do an anastomosis in a patient who uh, is in hemorrhagic shock. Come back a later day and do it at another time. Here's a, uh, what a vascular shunt looks like. This is an argyle shunt uh, in a femoral vessel. And uh, ultimately, you secure it on both ends with just some 207. Group. Um, our last speaker is Dr. or is Michael Hunter, the Deputy Chief EMS of UMass, and his talk is Emergency Medical Services. Hello, my name is Michael Hunter. I'm the Deputy Chief for EMS at uh, UMass Memorial Medical Center in Worcester, Massachusetts. We are the uh, region's tertiary care center. We have um, level one accreditation for pediatric and adult trauma with the STEMI center, our comprehensive stroke center. Additionally, we have the 911 ambulance service for the city of Worcester, the second largest city in New England. Uh, we employ around uh, 100 paramedics. We do our own uh, dispatching through uh, EMD as a secondary PSAP. And we have a uh, helicopter service for life flight uh, covering uh, most of the Northeast. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you guys about was emergency medical services and get you thinking that it's more than an ambulance ride. Uh, my goal is to have you a little bit more familiar with EMS and to also develop ways or think about ways to develop a partnership with your local EMS agency. Um, I have no conflicts of interest that I know of and if you're ready, we'll jump in. So we have a saying in EMS that if you've seen one EMS system, you have seen one EMS system. And basically what we're trying to say is that no two systems are alike. Nothing is uh, standardized across the United States or across the world. Each EMS system is different. It's usually tailored to fit the community and uh, provide the resources that that community, that hospital needs. So I would encourage all of you to become a little familiar with your EMS system within your community or within the uh, hospital that you're working at, what EMS system they use, which ambulance provider they use to transport patients. So let's take a little bit deeper dive in. So what are the level of providers? Well, the first level is the emergency first responder. Typically, first responders don't work on ambulances. Usually, these are firefighters, police officers. They get minimal first aid training. Um, we focus now heavily on stop the bleed with first responder training. They all should be adapted using tourniquets and um, hemostatic agents. They get a really basic uh, overview of childbirth, uh, provided everything goes really well. And they know the basics of bandaging, splinting, and what to look out for in a, in a medical emergency. Oftentimes, first responders will have the ability to drive ambulances uh, when needed. The emergency medical technician is the standard EMT, pretty much standardized across the country. It's about 110 hours of medical education with a test at the end. Um, all these levels, I should note, are certifications. They're not licensures, so they're not independent practitioners. Um, basic EMTs uh, know a little more than the first responders about medical emergencies, and they should be a little bit more adapted to bandaging and splinting, as well as things like pelvic binders, um, hair traction splints, some of the more advanced splinting techniques, and spinal immobilization or stabilization. Uh, the advanced EMT, we used to call intermediates, they're typically uh, individuals with um, a few hundred hours of training, and they're allowed to start IVs. Um, they should be fairly adept at supraglottic airways. They know basic ECG interpretation, but probably can't read a 12 lead. Um, and then you have the paramedic level, which has always been the gold standard. Um, it's just shy of um, a couple thousand hours of training. Oftentimes it comes with an associate's degree from a community college. Paramedics are adapted diagnosing or reading a 12 lead ECG. 
Um, they should be fairly advanced with the ability to start IVs and terraceous, as well as um, carry multiple medications, everything from cardiac medications through vasopressors. Um, it's not uncommon to see a nurse on an ambulance. Typically, these are more the critical care nurses that would be on helicopters or critical care ambulance services. A lot of times nurses um, that are in the EMS have had multiple years of experience in a critical care setting like an ICU or an ER. I included physician as well because in other countries uh, outside the U.S., physicians typically ride ambulances or frequently ride ambulances and oftentimes are anesthesiologists that are able to care for people uh, in their home. So the levels of care, and this is more the service than the individual provider, um, there's basic life support. Typically, these are the EMTs. These would be the folks that would do your inter um, transfers, maybe discharges to home, discharges to nursing homes. They're also what you would typically see in a small community for 911 providers. They're the people that get out of bed in the middle of the night and go and uh, help your uh, neighbors and provide basic life support. The advanced life support are those advanced EMTs all the way through the nurses and physicians. And it really talks about the ability to provide a uh, more advanced airway and endotracheal intubation, a surgical prike, or um, carrying medications. The interfacility transport is a, kind of a unique specialty for organizations that transport between facilities. This would be your, oh my God, get this patient out of my ER, get them to a tertiary care type of facility uh, transport. And it would usually involve paramedics or advanced EMTs. And oftentimes they have uh, further training. They should be fairly adept at uh, IV pumps as well as ventilators. Um, and what separates them from critical care transport is a critical care transport oftentimes is an air medical program, so they have the ability to fly and move patients much quicker, but also the, um, the critical care transport has the ability to adjust medications independently, where the interfacility folks usually have to uh, work with what's already been set. Both can carry blood, critical care usually can start blood. So what type of operations do you typically see? In EMS, the volunteer on call, those are your good neighbors, and they're still out there that want to get up and help their community, so they come in and do it for the love of, the, uh, of helping someone. Oftentimes, these are, uh, are EMTs. Um, occasionally, you'll get paramedics, uh, but most times, those paramedics, I would gather work full-time as a paramedic and then volunteer in their own community. Uh, Full-time paid kind of goes in with that private hospital-based or municipal. I mean, obviously, if there's companies out there that make uh, their money by providing ambulance service, and that's your private, usually for-profit organization. Um, the hospital-based, which is what I've done for my entire career since 1984, has been um, working in and out of hospitals, providing 911, and in some cases doing the interfacility transports. Municipal is often like your fire departments or your third service EMS. The one thing that's common amongst all EMS agencies pretty much everywhere is we're protocol driven. We're cookbook medicine. We um, have a list of what we can do. We uh, are identified and come up with a working diagnosis or a clinical impression, and then we follow that protocol um, and work on standing orders until we run out of standing orders, and then we'll rely on medical oversight, whether it's via cellular phone or by radio. And medical oversight um, is usually or should be heavily involved with advanced life support uh, services to not only do the direct medical care or control, but to do the quality assurance and be the medical guidance for that agency. Uh, actually, now in uh, emergency medicine, EMS is a subspecialty, and it's a boarded subspecialty of emergency medicine. To talk a little bit about protocols. I said we're pro protocol-driven, that we need to work off that cookbook medicine. The one thing we all have to remember are protocols are never written for the uh, best provider, the best service, it's always for the least, the least common denominator. So we have to uh, keep that in mind anytime you look at protocols. And when you say, well, why can't they do this? It's because you got to make sure that everybody is capable of doing this. And that goes to that scope of practice uh, as well. We all know what we can do and what we can't do. Um, while a first responder may have seen uh, a needle decompression done a hundred times, they it's still it's out of their scope of practice and they're not able to do that. 
The one thing as surgeons you may want to really take a look at is point of entry protocols. Um, if you have them or don't have them, I mean, what do you do with trauma patients, especially in a rural setting? Do you want everyone to come to your community hospital or do you have time limits where they should go to a, a tertiary care? Here in Massachusetts, you go to a level one trauma center. If you're within 30 minutes of a level one trauma center with a patient that meets uh, anatomical or physiological um, qualifications to, to bypass local hospitals and go directly to a tertiary care center. So that's something as surgeons you really want to take a look at and possibly become involved with. So what can you do additionally as surgeons to get involved with your local EMS, learn about your local EMS and their capabilities when they move your patients uh, or when they bring you patients? So there's training. And really, I probably should have labeled that as teaching more than training, because don't miss those teachable moments. If you're in the ER, if you're working with a patient, uh, as EMS comes in, take that opportunity, because most EMS providers just love to learn and love to be shown things by a physician or a surgeon. So if a surgeon will take the time to say, hey, come over here, I want you to take a look at this. This is what you see. This is uh, periorbital ecchymosis, or this is really what a flail chest looks like. So you can take that second to make that contact with the EMS provider. They get something out of it. You get to um, work with them a little bit, and you start to build that mutual respect. Um, the other thing is, is formal education, right? I mean, you guys have a wealth of knowledge that those EMS providers are looking for. So why not arrange a half hour class and invite EMS to come in and participate and learn a little bit about something that you do or something that you may have a passion for in medicine? Um, morbidity and mortality rounds, these are great. And if you don't have to do them like weekly, you could do like every six months or annually, just pick out half a dozen cases that EMS brought you and sit down and review them with the providers. They love to know the outcome of their patients that they brought in, um, so it helps immensely. Rounding, similar to M&Ms, um, at our facility we have trauma rounds in which we all get to meet with the trauma surgeons in an area, whether it's an ICU, the ER, or someplace, and they present on one case and we talk about it as it goes all the way through. So it's kind of a concentrated M&M, but it gives the providers a chance to go into a little bit different um, element and see a little bit more of the medicine and what you all do um, and how it relates back to them and with the difference they can make in the pre-hospital uh, setting, how it affects the patients in the um, in-hospital setting. So committees, kind of goes back to that point of entry protocols. Um, if you have a specialty, that is relevant to your community, why not get on the committee with EMS and help them to better their protocols, to have some input into what you want them doing, uh, what their scope of practice should be within your community for your patients. And that goes back to that protocol development. When we do protocols in Massachusetts, there's everything from EM doctors to anesthesiologists to surgeons to um, GPs on the committees that develop our protocol so that everyone has a say and that we all care well for their patients. You know, if you're really adventurous, go for a ride along. I'm sure you can make arrangements to get out on a local ambulance, do some 911 calls, go on a transfer or two, just see what it's like, see what the limitations are riding in the back of the ambulance. And I'll guarantee while you're there, they're going to be picking your brain about everything medical and everything in your specialty. Station visits kind of go a long way as well. Um, a doc stopping into the station, um, you know, especially if you bring coffee and donuts. Um, and just hanging out, saying hi to your EMS providers, letting them know that you appreciate what they do or want to develop a relationship with them is really a great start and a great way to uh, break that ice. Um, and literature, you know, most providers don't have the money to uh, get a subscription to the New England Journal of Medicine or even something like uh, pre-hospital emergency care or JAMA. So if you have your old magazines um, and you want to, you know, instead of just throwing away or recycling them, maybe work out an arrangement where you can bring some of your old journals down to the EMS station, or maybe for a Christmas gift or something as a thank you, just saying, hey, uh, let me get you a subscription to a, um, a journal. I'm sorry, it's my radar alarm saying it's time to wrap up. And lastly is the equipment. Um, 
you know, if you have something that you absolutely hate for equipment that you've seen brought in with patients, maybe that's the time to go talk with your EMS providers and make sure that you're all on the same page. If you really, really like one particular uh, traction splint or one particular pelvic binder or one particular needle for chest decompression, why not work with your EMS providers to make sure that that's what they're carrying and that's what they have on their ambulances so that you're all on the same page. So I'm gonna kind of wrap it all up and this is full circle where the goal should be with uh, EMS is to make sure that the right patient gets the right provider. You don't wanna send a critical patient out that's getting meds, vasopressors, multiple medications on a vent and try to do that with a first responder agency or even a BLS uh, basic life support. So make sure you get the right provider for the right patient. Uh, make sure that the provider is under the right protocol. Um, are you sending someone out that's within their scope of practice to do what they need to do for your patient? Or do you want them coming in with the right, uh, right equipment and right protocols for your patient? And that's the last thing is just like, make sure that everyone is you know, following through, do quality assurance on the patients you get. And I guess what I'm really asking you all to do is to engage with your EMS agency. Um, if you've seen one EMS agency, you've seen one EMS agency, so why not make it the one that's servicing your community and your patients? Um, and hopefully that relationship can lead to five-star reviews for everybody. I thank you very much for your time and I, I wish you all well.